Good morning. <clears throat> Yesterday we had a wonderful fall gathering, although virtual, with over a hundred hearing Sayyidna speak to us at 9 a.m. and then each of the groups, that is the organizations of our diocese gathered in their own groups for their own, um, for their own meeting. And a new group that is being formed is a fellowship of Antiochian men. We are uh, in need of not just another organization, we are in need of laborers in the church. And in that particular gathering, I shared <laughs> how that we seem to have two groups of men. Those that are unafraid to get their hands dirty, <laughs> And those who would rather pay to have things done. You know, I mean, if you, if you pay for somebody to cut your yard and if you pay for somebody to clean your house and you pay for somebody to drive your kids to school or whatever you pay, then why do you need to do it in the church? <laughs> okay, give. <laughs> give to the church. There should be no excuse for anyone's shared stewardship in whatever way. But by the same token, we need a fellowship of men. And so, God willing, we are thinking creatively of ways of which we can build fellowship among those that don't mind getting their hands dirty <laughs> and those who would rather just write a check. I'm not saying that those that just write a check don't get their hands dirty. But you know what I'm talking about. We live in a time where apparently time is very important to all of us. And there's probably no other time than what we are now facing where we come to understand how in fact we are using our time. And time is as much a part of our Christian stewardship Today's gospel lesson is truly a beautiful analogy, an icon of truth. You know, in the new church, in time, there will not only be icons of <clears throat> the images of Christ, the Theotokos, John the Baptist, and our patron or saints, but we have images in our tradition that include, like today's gospel, there is the icon of the Good Shepherd. There's the icon of the Good Samaritan. These are the gospel teachings, and they dawn the church. So God willing, in time, all of these images. Today we commemorate the Holy Fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, over 370 of them that gathered in the city of Nicaea, to resolve once and for all the question after a hundred years of bloodshed over images that according to our teaching is not an idol. And perhaps one of the ways that we can best speak about them is to say they are virtual. <laughs> virtual images of something very real but is conveyed to us as we enter and participate in prayer to God, calling upon many to intercede for us. I've spoken in the past about what I'm about to share with you. Many of you have heard it, but I'm especially speaking again in part over this particular gospel lesson for those of you who are live streaming with us who have not heard it before. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Christ, is in our midst. Being a, a disciple of the Lord is living our lives as a plant that is rooted in good soil. Plants in good soil produce good fruit. <clears throat> Similarly, being well grounded in the garden of the church is where we grow in faith and love with the care of the gardener who is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I hope that I will not surprise you by saying that the church does not only consist of like-minded adults. <laughs> it never really has. There's a great diversity. In our Bible study, we have been learning how that the Church of Asia Minor, and particularly our Mother Church of Antioch, is characterized by this cosmopolitan diversity which has much to teach us today about mutual respect, mutual understanding, and understanding the faith correctly. There's a great diversity in the church. It consists of families of succeeding generations, large extended families, small families, single parents, young adults, immigrant households, and people of many backgrounds. God's garden is a very big garden. One that consists of numerous plants, all kinds of plants, but all very important to him as they are to us as we regard each other created in his image and called by his design for a purpose. Today's gospel lesson illustrates God as the gardener who sows the seeds generously and without hesitation. The lesson makes clear that the seeds that are spread are his words widely and freely distributed to all who have ears to hear. However, as the lesson describes, the circumstances and the environment of where the seeds fall determine whether or not they grow and survive. Similarly, our survival and the survival of our families in particular has much to do with our life in the good soil. The good soil of the church that fosters growth with the bonds of fellowship in all that we share as members of the one body of Christ. But most importantly, we Orthodox understand that our spiritual health and well-being are tied to our mental and physical health also in our relationships with each other. And especially then, we are all dependent upon having the Lord Jesus Christ as our gardener, who forgives and heals, who renews and regenerates, who illumines and sanctifies, who guards and protects our lives. In our weekly Thursday evening adult class, we've recently been focusing upon intimacy with the curriculum provided by Faith Tree. Intimacy. Seeing how the qualities of God's love, such as trust, truth, compassion, self-sacrifice, and patience, are what comprises the best foundation for an intimate relationship. Because you know today, many of us struggle, not only young people, with intimacy. We'd rather be virtual. 
we'd rather create a meme, and I've just learned what that word meant, never knew that, or all kinds of false images, impressions. As we discussed in one gathering, you know, you go for a, a job application and you pull out the right resume that you have that applies to that particular job, so you want to give the best impression. It's not wrong, but that's just a part of you that's conveyed in achieving your goal of getting a job. And so we've also understood that relationships are intimate but are built slowly. And that boundaries are sometimes necessary and actually strengthens intimacy. And even in the lesson of today's gospel, we understand that you and even I as a priest are not in charge or even able to determine everything about what happens or may happen in our lives or the lives of our loved ones. The Lord is our gardener. And you and I must have the willingness to be cared for in ways that we don't always understand. <clears throat> in a world that presents us with many trials and challenges. Just as any garden faces the change of seasons, pestilences, storms, and threatening fires. Also, good and healthy plants from time to time may require proper pruning, treatment. And so we need the proper spiritual guidance. We need the proper care from our tradition of men and women whose lives were changed through the centuries. Those who are the living examples of faith who have known the transformative power of God through repentance and who understand conversion as a lifelong recovery from the setbacks and impediments of sin. St. Gregory Palamas said, for the confession of sins is the beginning of cultivation. It's how we prepare to receive the word of God, the seed planted in our hearts for our salvation, his word. One of my favorite writers, C.S. Lewis, also describes in his book about the Psalms that the tilling of the soil is like the need of preparing our hearts for the rain so that when it comes, it will moisten and provide the good soil for the word of God to germinate. And we might add, what would happen if there was no tilling of the soil, no contrition of heart, no true repentance? There would only be a flood over parched ground and the hardness of one's heart that experiences no spiritual transformation. And such are the lives of some. Lastly, all that I've been saying takes time and diligent effort. You know, it takes time to know someone. And not virtually. And if there is to be any mature growth, we only grow where we are planted. As St. Francis de Sal, Bishop of Geneva, once said, beginning with a quote from the Holy Apostle Paul to the Romans, he said, the love of God has been poured into our hearts by his Spirit, dwelling in each one of us, calling us to a life of devotion and inviting us to bloom in the garden where he has planted and directing us to radiate the beauty and spread the fragrance of his providence. Beautiful words. Nobody grows by running away from anything. 
except to be saved from harm, or when his life may be threatened without any defense, or should there be a lack of needed care. If you and I or our children are to acquire any assurance that is built on God's love and the steadfastness of faith, and if you and I are to thrive with hope, then we must do well in growing where we are planted. We hear the prophet Jeremiah say this. Blessed is he who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Jeremiah 17, 7 to 8. I'm also reminded of the beautiful hymnology of Great Vespers, not sung much anymore. <laughs> it's from the first psalm, and the words of the hymn are these. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law does he meditate day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Wherever he is, he prospers. Once again, such a faith and assurance is found when a person is grounded in a relationship to our Lord Jesus Christ who sees and understands that relationship to include our brother and sister. So let me conclude. A well-tended garden, which by the way, in God's vision, is not only a temporal but an eternal field. A well-tended garden is not like a potted plant that can be moved from place to place, is stunted by a pot, that causes it to be root-bound, nor is the type of a garden we're speaking of like a terrarium in an enclosed hotel lobby, you've seen them, with plants that grow in an artificial environment and must be replaced at times. And surely no real garden has any artificial plants that may look very nice but are not real, in fact, are without any life. No. The plant in a well-tended garden is never stunted or root-bound. It lives in the real world and has no limit to the depth of its roots and its growth. It lives and thrives through every season, every adversity, and is guarded and protected, cared and loved by its gardener. And so, beloved, as we press on through these unusual days and now anticipate a holiday season that is probably going to be unlike any we have experienced before, let us put our hope and trust in the good gardener who knows what he is doing. Let us be sure that we know what we are doing in order that the good gardener who knows what is good for us, who cares for us and loves us, may be a help to our every need, spiritual, physical, emotional, intellectual. For he may... For he is not only a good gardener, he is our creator. He is our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. He is truly in our midst. Help us, save us, have mercy on us, and keep us, O God, by thy grace, wisdom, 
that guarded always by thy might 